Poverty and the Spectre of Capital, um, published by Verso in 2013, and Locked in Place, State Building and Late Industrialization in India, published by Princeton in 2003. Also known for his critique of the post-colonial studies and the defense of Marxism and the universal application, including countries outside of Europe. Um, currently, there's going to be a book published uh, that will be coming out in January called The Class Matrix, Social Theory After the Cultural Turn. And um, I think there's a second book that um, will be coming out, um, which Com Comrade Bivik will then present to us. Um, during his presentation, he'll also make an announcement just to indicate that the, the first book coming out in January is going to be published by the Harvard University Press. So quite an, ex uh, an esteemed uh, comrade that's joining us today and what an absolute privilege from all of us um, to participate and have him on the panel. Comrade Vivek, a very good afternoon to you and the floor is yours. Thank you, Hamida, and uh, everyone who worked uh, to make this event happen. It's quite an honor. I, I did, uh, I was in South Africa, I think it was in 2017. I'm not entirely sure, it might've been 2018. Uh, the, my sense of time is skewed now after a year of COVID. But um, I gave a, a presentation at your center, I recall, on nationalism and another one on uh, the relevance of the Russian Revolution. It was a tremendous experience. The level of conversation was so high and uh, it was wonderful to see the, still a left uh, alive and functioning in South Africa. And I'm very happy to contribute to it again today. The uh, organizers were kind enough to give me a very small topic, something very easy to handle. Uh, Marxism and imperialism in the 21st century. So I said, of course, this is something one can give a complete talk on in just a few minutes, so I'd be happy to oblige. Um, but uh, in seriousness, it, it's such an immense topic that I, I thought what I would do is in the span of time available to me, lay out a broad framework for how socialists understand or should understand the, the role of imperialism in the development of capitalism and the role of imperialism in capitalism today. And then of course, as socialists, the most important question about how to fight it, what to do about it. And this will be a broad framework. Many of the details, the implications, how it relates to the Marxist tradition and its understanding of imperialism generally, all of these things should, I think, be dealt with in questions and answers. So I would encourage all of you to um, not hold back in the um, discussion section because uh, much of the nuance is going to be left out of this talk. And what I have to say about imperialism is uh, different from what the received tradition in Marxism is, which in part I'm critiquing. So um, with that, uh, let me give you the elements of what I think a defensible Marxist understanding of imperialism ought to be. To understand the phenomenon, we need to ask three questions. Any Marxist has to ask three questions. One is, what do we mean by imperialism? Like any discussion, you first have to have a crisp understanding of what the object is that you're trying to understand. If you define imperialism differently, then you will also theorize it differently. And we need to make sure that all of us are on the same page when we use the term. So first thing we have to do is define it. Secondly, we have to understand what is the relationship of imperialism to capitalism? And by this, we mean, how does imperialism relate to the historical origins and to the subsequent growth of capitalism? And how does imperialism relate to capitalism today as we find it? And then third, of course, is the question of what we can do about it. So let me launch into that. Most Marxists agree, and I, I don't, it's important we have a definition of imperialism that is broadly agreed upon. Because if you have a very, very idiosyncratic definition of the term, then it's going to be hard to have a general discussion of it because all the debate will be over how you define it. So I'm gonna define it in a way that most Marxists will agree to it, which is it's a situation in which one region, one country, one nation state dominates, and restricts the self-determination of another. So imperialism is fundamentally a relation of domination between nation states. This domination can employ different mechanisms. 
to sustain it. There can be a military uh, mechanism, that is to say you use military force to dominate another country. It can be political, you use diplomatic measures or political uh, suasion, political threats. And finally, it can be economic. Most famously, as we all understand, institutions like the IMF or the World Bank can be used to impose uh, America's or Europe, Europe's will over another country, banks, multinational corporations. These are all economic methods through which one country can dominate another. And it can also take different forms. The most obvious form that imperialism takes, whether it's coming through diplomatic or military or economic instruments, the most obvious form is colonialism. Colonialism is the most visible manifestation of imperialism, uh, or it can be an informal empire, informal domination. That is to say, what in the uh, 60s and 70s Marxists in Africa and elsewhere called neo-colonialism, which is a situation where you have formal independence, but still de facto uh, subjugation to another country. So imperialism then is a relation of domination. That domination can be effectuated through military, diplomat, uh, political or economic mechanisms. And it can take either direct colonial form or an indirect form of uh, informal domination. Now that's what we mean by, I think most our Marxists will agree that when they talk about imperialism, this is what they mean. If that being the case, we can move then to the second question, which is what's the relation of imperialism to capitalism? Now, this is anything but a straightforward question in the Marxist tradition. And within the tradition, right from the time of Lenin, Luxembourg, Kautsky onward, there's been tremendous debate. Let me just go through some of the dominant views on this and where I think there are some flaws in some of those views. The, what all socialists understand and agree upon is that imperialism is in some way driven by economic forces. Their socialists of all stripes agree that the explanation for what drives imperialism has to relate to the economy, economic motives, economic interest in some way or form. Okay, but while this is a simple statement or a seemingly simple statement, it's actually not at all obvious what such a claim about economic motives actually entails. One common argument is that, and this is coming back in force in uh, the revival of the left over the past six or eight years. One common argument is that capitalism owes its very origins to economic plunder. So here, the economic motive or the economic roots of imperialism are that without imperialism, you could never even have had capitalism. So imperialism is built right into the DNA of the system. And you see in some parts of his work, Marx also seems to be saying this. Very famously in volume one of Capital, Marx says that primitive accumulation is the key precondition for the rise of capitalism. And then he seems to mean by primitive accumulation, uh, the gathering up, the buildup, of an initial stock of wealth. That's what the word accumulation entails. You accumulate enough money to be able to reinvest it, and that is primitive accumulation. Once you have enough money as a nation state, the capitalists in that nation state to invest it capitalistically, now you can uh, move towards the origins and then the growth of capitalism. Within that primitive accumulation, he lists colonialism and colonial plunder as one of the uh, means by which that money is accumulated. Now, that has given some Marxists the impression or the idea that the credit or the criticism of the growth of capitalism, the origins of capitalism should at least in part go to colonialism. Now, in part, you can say colonialism did play a role and colonial plunder in particular did play a role in perhaps accelerating the origins of capitalism. But if the question very precisely is, did colonial plunder actually effectuate 
or help bring about the origins of capitalism? The answer is quite clearly no. In fact, colonialism not only played almost no role or a very minor role in the origins of capitalism, I think you could make an argument and I would make the argument that it actually impeded. That is to say colonialism in the early modern era, in those countries that practiced it, did very little to bring capitalism about and in fact blocked it. Why would we say this? Well, there's a great deal of historical scholarship on it. Let's sidestep that and just look at the very basic, very bold facts. The two countries that had the largest empires in the early modern world before the rise of capitalism and therefore should have been the countries that hastened the transition to capitalism by virtue of having all this advantage of colonial plunder, those two countries were Spain and Portugal. Spain and Portugal together commanded the largest empires in the world between say 1450 and 1650. What happens through that colonial venture? Those two countries not only failed to undergo a transition to capitalism, they very rapidly became the most backward countries in Western Europe. Why is that? Very simple reason. And this is why a Marxist account of the origins of capitalism cannot advert to the use of colonial plunder. The key to a Marxist political or economic account of how an economy works is not whether or not there's money in the economy to be invested. The key to a Marxian account is that the class structure of a country determines how and why ruling classes invest the surpluses that they extract. If the class structure is a feudal one, ruling classes use their money in a feudalistic way. If a class structure is a capitalist one, ruling classes use their money in a capitalistic way. In both cases, you're extracting a surplus. What you do with a surplus though is very, very different if you're a feudal lord or if you're a capitalist entrepreneur. What Spain and Portugal do with these enormous oceans of wealth that they extract from the new world is that they waste it on lordly consumption. They fritter it away on warfare, or it simply leaves the country and ends up, most of it in fact, ended up in Asia because they used it to buy Asian goods and in fact, expand the Asian economy, the Chinese and the Indian. The key therefore to a Marxist framework is not whether countries were accumulating funds and wealth from colonialism. That was true in the Roman empire as well. It was true all over the early modern. World. Why didn't you get capitalism in Rome? That was an empire. Why didn't you get capitalism in the Greek city-states? Why did you not get capitalism in China or India? These were vast empires, much like Spain's and Portugal. The reason you don't is that the key is what you do with the money, not whether or not you have the money. Spain and Portugal frittered away. Where do you in fact get the origins of capitalism? You get it in England and you get it in the low countries between 1550 and 1650. And at that time, England, has almost no empire to speak of. It's just entering the imperial phase of its history. England undergoes a transition to capitalism before it ever, ever has a major empire. Spain and Portugal have major empires, but never undergo a transition to capitalism until the 19th century, maybe the 20th century. Capitalism therefore does not rely on colonial plunder in order to make it to the historical stage. And therefore it's quite an error to say that imperialism or colonial plunder was built into the origins of capitalism or that the system relied on it. In fact, it never did. Now, why I've already said that this is in part a theoretical error <clears throat> is a theoretical error because it misunderstands how class works. Class structures set the terms, the rules that investors that the wealthy have to follow as to what they do with their money. The second error that it makes is that this understanding of imperialism assumes that capitalism needs constant access to external markets in order to survive. So here the argument then is that if you don't have an empire that's constantly expanding, 
capitalism will fail to get off the ground because it doesn't have enough money inside the system for it to reinvest it, for it to uh, undergo the transition to a new economy. The difficulty here is though, feudalism has vast stores of wealth, which were already there for it to reinvest in a capitalistic way. If there was no transition to capitalism, it wasn't because lords didn't have the money and, didn't, and needed access to foreign markets to get that money. The difficulty here is that lords were sitting on piles and piles of money, but they simply wasted all of it. So in the origin stage, there, it's very hard to make the argument that capitalism needed imperialism to get off the ground. All right, so some Marxists take a different tack, and their argument is, okay, it may not have needed imperialism to get off the ground, but capitalism requires imperialism to sustain itself, to keep moving, to keep going, to, to renew itself. This is called an underconsumptionist argument. What underconsumptionists say is that capitalism suffers from insufficient demand. It doesn't have enough money inside the system to keep expanding because workers are the main market in capitalism. Workers' wages are always kept to a minimum. And because they're kept to a minimum, capitalists can't sell all the goods that they make. Because they can't sell all the goods that they make, they have to look outward. They have to look into the rest of the world for markets. And so they expand using political power into the rest of the world. They use their political power to break down barriers, to go into third world countries. They expropriate the peasantry. They create capitalism in those countries. That gives them a market. And now the goods that they can't sell domestically, they sell to the rest of the world. Okay. The fundamental argument there is, once again, the drive to have an imperial system, a colonial system, is built into the very logic of capitalism, without which capitalism will collapse. Well, this argument was made most ambitiously by Rosa Luxemburg uh, in her famous book, uh, The Accumulation of Capital. And right at the time that it was made, it came under withering criticism, both from Bukharin uh, and also from other Marxists at the time. And that criticism, I think, was correct. And most Marxists reject this argument. Most Marxist economists reject it. Among activist circles, though, and in political circles, you still see it circulated quite a bit. So let me just address it in very brief uh, measure. The basic problem with this argument, as Bukharin pointed out, is that it fails to understand capitalism does not need external markets in order to expand because capitalism creates its own market. That is to say, Capitalism in one region is constantly expanding the market in that very same region. Why is that? It's because the system not only relies on workers' wages to expand, it also relies on the demand coming from investment in order to expand. And in, at any given moment, that investment is always growing. It's a fact about capitalism that investment is constantly going up. It's so rare for investment to stop expanding that we have a special term for it, recessions. The only time ex investment stops expanding in capitalism is when the economy actually starts to shrink. And those episodes of e economic shrinkage are actually exceedingly rare. They are, the severe episodes are called economic depressions. They occur every 30, 40, sometimes 50 years. Recessions occur periodically every 10 to 15 years. In between these moments, the system is constantly growing. It is constantly growing through a accumulation of capital, through the growth of investment. As investment grows, so do wages. Wages are also, therefore, not the level of the wages, but the total money going into wages is always expanding. The rate may vary, but it's expanding. That means the market is always expanding. And so it's not the system suffers from chronic lack of demand. The system actually creates its own demand. Because it's creating its own demand, it does not need to constantly find external markets. It is happy to find them. It likes having them, but it does not depend on them. It depends on constantly expanding the market where it has already Taken, uh, taken root. All right, this understanding that I've just laid out is also confirmed in the actual history of colonialism. 
Luxembourg says that when capitalism goes into foreign countries, it goes in order to create markets for itself. It needs to create those markets because it has insufficient markets at home. All right, well, if that were true, what you should expect to find when the English or the French expand into Africa or expand into Asia in the 18th and 19th centuries, what you'd ex you should expect to find is that they go in there and they expropriate the bulk of the population. They immediately take their land away. They turn peasants into workers. And in so doing, they create a market for wage goods. If the peasantry is not expropriated, you haven't created a market because peasants overwhelmingly produce for their own consumption. All right, so what do you find when you see the English or the French or the Germans going into Africa and Asia? They do the exact opposite. They do not expropriate the peasantry. They do not uh, create a vast pool of wage labor. In fact, what they do is they pass laws more or less strengthening peasant property. They pass laws that actually give peasants, uh, reinforce peasants' rights to the land over time. The reason was simple. They were terrified of expropriating the peasantry because that creates a social revolution. They didn't have the manpower to exert sufficient control in these countries to oversee such a profound social transformation, a transformation which in England takes over a hundred years to undergo. In the colonies would have had to have been done in a decade or two. They never did it. If they had depended on those markets for the growth of capitalism, they would have taken the plunge and yet they never did. So the history of colonialism actually overturns the Luxembourgist or underconsumptionist idea that without colonialism, without colonial plunder, the system would collapse. So that leaves us with the question, if they didn't require the colonies, why did the West go about acquiring them? Well, this is where we start now building the alternative framework, which will help us understand the role of imperialism today. Why did they acquire colonies? They did not acquire them because the system needed them. They did not acquire them because capitalism as an economic system needed them. They acquired them because of the particular way in which the capitalist class and the capitalist state relate to each other. It's not that the state sanctioned and agreed to colonial expansion because it knew that the system needed it. It's that the state in any bourgeois society is very vulnerable to the pressure of the capitalist class. While the system did not require colonialism and imperialism, capitalists within the system would benefit from acquiring access to markets or raw materials or labor power in the developing world, in the third world. And as long as they could pressure the state to help them in their design as capitalists, in their profit-seeking ventures, and as long as the state saw that it could get away with it, it could bear the political and economic costs of taking over another country, as long as they could get away with it, states were willing to do it. So the reason that what you find in the 18th, 19th centuries is capitalist states are not constantly pushing outward to acquire colonies. In fact, they're quite resistant to do so. But in particular moments, at particular times, capitalists as individuals or as groups prevail upon the state to undertake the venture. The state surveys the domestic scene and says, can we afford it? Can we get away with it? Can we pass on the cost to others? And if it can do so, the state agrees. Interestingly, in most of the countries where the English state or the French state relented to capitalist pressures and agreed to take on colonies, once they were there, they took a very passive role, a quite conservative role because they had been dragged into it reluctantly by the capitalist class. It's the capitalists who then try to make the best of it and then in tandem with the colonial state create a situation in which they as individuals, as firms can benefit from it. Colonialism therefore was always done not to the benefit of the system as a whole, but to capitalists within that system. Those, and it was the capitalists who overwhelmingly benefited from it. Now, 
This might seem like a nuance, but it's a very important distinction. In the traditional Leninist understanding of imperialism, because the system itself depends on it, everybody has a stake in imperialism. I'm gonna to come to this in a minute, but, under, but see the difference. Everybody has a stake, workers have a stake in it, capitalists have a stake in it, the, stake has a, the state has a stake in it. And so nations as a whole mobilize to uh, behind the imperial venture. In fact, Lenin said, you actually get a labor aristocracy that benefits from this and has a stake in it. What I'm saying is now something quite different. What I'm saying is the system does not depend on it. The system, in fact, depends on an internal engine of accumulation that it generates by itself. The reason you get imperialism is because particular classes benefit from it. And indeed, not even the entire class, groups, constellations, segments of capital benefit from it. And they're the ones, therefore, who have the stake in it, not the working class, perhaps in many instances, not even the middle class. It's the capitalists who are driving it, who benefit from it, who then set up the constellations of power that sustain it. Okay, this is an important difference and it brings us now to the next question, the next issue, which is in the Leninist theory, you not only had a massive drive for capital to expand outward and uh, uh, impose imperial or colonial solutions on the rest of the world, the working class also develops a stake in it. And the basic idea is this, Monopoly capital goes out into the world. It establishes a beachhead in the third world. It now extracts super profits. That is to say, above normal profits from its colonial ventures. Those super profits then are, at least in some part, parlayed or passed on to the working class in the imperial country. That working class now is benefiting from the fruits of imperialism because it's benefiting from it it is enriched by it, it now, A, has a stake in the imperial venture, and B, grows more conservative. Lenin used this theory to try to explain why the English working class or the French working class had not become as radical as the Russian or the German. Okay, that he called the labor aristocracy. Marxists have used this explanation for the longest time to try to explain why there has been no revolution in the West. The reason there's no revolution is workers are hooked into the imperial system and its benefits and therefore conservative because of it. Now, I would urge, this is fundamentally flawed. Let's start with the theory again. It is a curious mutation of Marxism whose very essence is, that, is to claim that there is a struggle between labor and capital within the system, that capital makes its profits by extracting a surplus from labor, and that capital is forced to do so because containing costs, minimizing costs is the only way they can survive in the market, and thereby they have to squeeze labor. It's quite a mutation to say that in this theory, you now can have not only an episode of worker capital alliances, episodes are always possible, for brief periods, you might have an alliance of some kind. Lenin's theory says you've now entered a stage of capitalism where such alliances between labor and capital around empire are going to become, if not permanent, then log standing. This means class struggle is over at home. That's essentially what it means. Now, theoretically, we should be suspicious of any such claim. Now, let's look at it empirically. Is it true that workers benefit from imperialism? Well, we actually are in a period of capitalist history where we can test this very well. And I would, I would uh, refer you to a great article by Rama Vasudeva in Catalyst, I think it was uh, in 2019, where she posed this question. And the question she posed was, if the argument behind the labor aristocracy and the fruits of imperialism were true, the period in capitalist history where the workers in the West should have been the most, the biggest beneficiaries of imperialism is the past 40 years. Why? Because there has never been an expansion of Western American multinational corporation into the rest of the world, American trade with the world, the, uh, the outward mo uh, movement of American capital into the world 
there's never been a time when it was greater, bigger, and deeper than the last 40 years. So if the Leninist theory is true, workers should have been, at the very least, getting substantial gains in their wages from all this fruit of capital investment abroad. Because of course, in the traditional theory, the export of capital is the taproot of imperialism. And we've seen more export of American capital in the past 40 years than ever before. Well, what do we find in these past years? As the system has moved outward, as American investors have gone out into the rest of the world, wages in the United States actually have been flat. Wages have stagnated in the entire era of globalization. They have remained more or less the same. Well, where did the profits go from all that investment? Because surely capitalists went out only because they were making profits. Well, now the evidence is right before us. All the profit went to the executive class. Some of it went to the managers but all of it stayed within the top one or top 2% of the earners in the United States. And what that means then, workers never had a stake in the expansion of American profits abroad because they, they were never allowed access to it. Why were they not allow, allowed access to it? For reasons that any Marxist should find very familiar. It's because the capitalist class bosses take the profits that they make and they either consume it themselves or they reinvest it for the expansion of their operations. They do not hand it off to workers as a bribe. Why would they ever do it unless the workers force them through class struggle to do it? The last 40 years, there has been no class struggle in the United States. It has been a one-sided class war. And when capitalists see no reason to give some of their profits back in wages, they will not do so. They will not give those profits to them. And that means therefore, once again, just like in the 19th, 18th centuries where I said imperialism came about because capitalists in partnership with the state ventured outward, not because the system needed it, just as in those centuries, so in our time, the expansion of capital abroad has not been a national project to enrich the United States or for the necessity of the system as a whole. It's been a boondoggle. It's essentially been a partnership between labor, between capital and the state, which benefits only capital. And not only does the working class not benefit from this imperialism, in fact, the working class is forced to foot the bill. Every time the United States uses its military, it's coming out of a general tax revenue to which workers contribute. But the benefits of the uses of that military, the benefits of the expansion into the Middle East, the benefits of the uh, trade barriers being broken down, do not go to those workers. They haven't gone to those workers. They have gone to the people who employ those workers. Workers therefore foot the bill of imperial expansion. They pay the costs. They do not benefit from the profits that come out of it. In other words, the basic principle of imperialism is exactly the same as the principle of domestic policy, which is the general population foots the bill. In other words, the costs are socialized, but the profits are privatized. Imperialism functions in more or less the same way as the political economy of domestic policy. The state passes on costs of all of its measures onto the general population through tax revenue, the benefits of which go to the employer class and their immediate servants, the managers, the top level managers who work for them. Imperialism, therefore, is no different in that regard from the class politics of domestic policy. It's a boondoggle. It's a strategy to use profit, to use power to expand profits. It is not a systemic drive, a systemic necessity, which uh, keeps the system alive. All right. That gives us then a way to summarize how to understand imperialism. It is not a stage of capitalism, it was always around. It is not driven by a systemic need on the part of the economy. It never was, the economy is self-sustaining. It was driven through political motives of the state and in partnership with the economic motives of the capitalist class. And its benefits never went to the entire population. It went to those same actors who ruled the country. And what that means therefore, 
is that we have the objective basis for an alliance between workers in the developing world who are exploited by the multinationals, who are exploited by the capital coming from the West that is uh, using them as wage labor and workers in the West who mistakenly by the followers of Lenin were thought to be hooked into the imperial system. They're not. In fact, they suffer from the imperial system because they suffer, because they foot the bill and they don't get the benefits. They have an objective interest in fighting against imperialism, much the same as workers in the global South do. And so you have a theory now that's more consistent with our practice. Marxists have always said that the working class movement is an international movement. And yet they've been burdened with a theory that tells them that it might be an international movement in principle, but in practice, Western workers cannot be trusted. This was the basis for third worldism in the 60s and 70s, which was effectively criticized by Marxists at that time and had been criticized by many of the elements of the second and third international as well. Problem is the second and third international was schizophrenic. It was committed to internationalism, but at the same time, it was burdened with a theory that undermined internationalism. That theory came from a flawed understanding of how capitalism works. I should say not understanding, flawed theorization. In their politics, they understood it. But the theory that they worked with was one which got in the way of effective politics. Now, through 70, 80 years of the development of Marxist economics, through a careful study of capitalist history, of colonial history, I think we can safely say that the elements in the second and third international that were critical of underconsumptionism, that were critical of what today we call third worldism, that were critical of a kind of nationalism to which it gave rise, they were correct. And those elements which used the theories that I'm criticizing, which relied on them, were not only incorrect, but they left us a legacy that we have to somehow now itch. All right. Now, if my argument is correct, it means even though capitalism does not rely on imperialism, it will be happy to keep that imperialism going as long as the state can pass on the costs to the relevant populations. That primarily is its own population. That means we should expect to find that it'll keep going until that population starts to fight against imperialism. And the state finds that it's too costly it's too impractical to keep the imperial machine going. Now, as it happens, that's already in progress. Why did the West give up colonialism? It didn't give it up because it was sick of it. It didn't give it up because it stopped reaping profits. It gave colonialism up because it became too expensive to maintain it, expensive in two ways. The, colonial, the colonized countries rose up to revolt, which meant the West had to devote ever more resources to keeping control. And at a certain point, it decided it just, wasn't, it just wasn't worth it. Secondly, there developed a powerful anti-imperial movement in the West itself. No better example of that than the Vietnam War. The Vietnam War was the most amazing combination of costs going up from because of armed struggle in Vietnam against US aggression, which made it very difficult to sustain, but then also a movement at home, which made it politically illegitimate to sustain that horrible venture inside Southeast Asia. The state had to move back. Colonialism in the 21st century is off the agenda. It will not come back. The reason it won't come back is states can't maintain it anymore. Even militarism now is having a hard time. The United States would love to invade Iran. It would do it tomorrow if it could. Why won't it? It won't because A, the Iranian state is too powerful, it'll be too costly. B, the American population will not tolerate the level of losses of soldiers, of resources that it will take to vanquish Iran. So it's off the agenda. The US is retreating from Afghanistan. Why? It can't sustain its military over there. It just is not worth the effort. It's not that military aggression or imperial aggression will end. In our lifetime, this certainly won't. So don't take my argument as saying that now empire or imperial aggression is coming to an end. It is not. What's happening is that it's becoming increasingly constrained. It's becoming constrained because states are finding that externally and internally, it takes too much to sustain it. 
So they're being forced to use other measures in order to impose their will, their dominance onto the rest of the world. Colonialism is out. The military option is still available, but more constrained. So what they're having to resort to is the economic. That's what, a, what imperialism right now is fundamentally having to do. But that is a very weak, very weak measure compared to the last two centuries. In that sense, we should be happy. The prospects for old style imperialism in the 21st century coming back are very dim, unlikely to happen. What you will still find happening is episodes of aggression where they think they can get away with it, that is to say where they can pass it off to the domestic population and where they think the resistance in the targeted country will be small enough that they can get what they want without a long commitment with long loss of resources. All right, if that's the case, then it brings us to our final and third question. What can we do to fight it? We can do actually the, exactly the same thing we've been doing for a hundred years as socialists. My argument suggests that the anti-imperialist struggle is very, very same to the anti-capitalist struggle. In the United States, the best way the left can make a, a gain against imperialism is by building the labor movement, making it stronger, and forcing the state to take its resources and devote it not to the military, but to government programs, healthcare, schools, all of that drains the budget that otherwise is going to the military. That's another way of saying the best way the working class in the West can fight imperialism is by refusing to foot the bill, by saying that it is not us who will pay. In fact, the money that we're paying into the tax revenues should come back to us as public goods. That's what happened in Europe after 1945. England had to withdraw from empire and hand it off to the United States because it could not afford to maintain its outposts in the Middle East. The NHS destroyed the British global empire. The same thing can happen in the United States. Inside the third world, the best thing to do is to build up resistance to not just the uh, imperial capitalist class, but to your own. In building up that resistance, in building up labor institutions, in building up a capacity for labor to struggle. It makes it all the harder for multinationals to come into South Africa unimpeded, for multinationals to come in and set up outposts of super exploitation because it's a revived and strong labor movement that makes that impossible. You'll send them elsewhere. And when they go elsewhere, the working class there has to struggle, has to fight to not allow them to exploit in the same way that it did before. And in that struggle, you're buoyed by the fact that American workers now can be seen to have an interest in linking up with African workers, linking up with Middle Eastern workers, because that same struggle benefits both sides, both divides of the, ge of the geography, workers in the West, workers in the South. Now, as I said, this is a very broad framework. Uh, you can see that it is quite different from the traditional Leninist framework, but what it keeps intact is Lenin's commitment to building a global working class uh, uh, struggle, to fighting against capital, and fighting against Western advanced capitalist aggression against the global South. The politics are, are vindicated, and I think even deepened. But I think we just have a theory that's more consistent with those politics Whereas in the traditional theories that we inherited from the second and third internationals, you oftentimes have to ignore the theory to carry out your politics or through some torturous means, modify that theory here and there eclectically to justify your politics. I, I think in the 21st century, we have to realize imperialism is and always was a class project, never a national project. And because it's a class project, Workers everywhere have an interest against it, whether they're white, brown, or black, whether they're in the West or whether they're in the South. Okay, I'll stop. Wow, thank, thank you very much. I must say, I've been taking, um, you know, what's name, frantic notes and a couple of the, the, the you know, suppositions of, or the positions that you're reporting um, even for me, created <laughs> some kinds of anxiety also. Um, 
contradictions and, and, and you know, it sent, sent off a couple of ringing bells like, really? <laughs> but I think your, your, your key point on the issue of it being a class struggle and the issue, you know, the, I think the, the way you juxtaposed, it's not necessarily the state, but it's actually a class um, and capitalist class in particular that's putting forward both uh, within colonialism and imperialism. I don't think anybody can doubt that, but I think, you know, the way in which pushing us to think outside of it being a nationalist a project as opposed to a class project. Um, in many instances, they can be conflated. So I think quite a, quite a lot of very provocative points uh, that you've made. I think I'm, I'm going to now open the floor um, for, for, for uh, at the risk of, you know, usually when you're at the chair and you've got such an amazing speaker, uh, you can dominate. But I think just before I do that, if I could also just uh, make a correction, just to say that, the, again, uh, a very well, welcome to everybody who's joined uh, the session. And just to note that it, we, you at the Dialogues for Anti-Capitalism, a capitalist future and it and, and the the um collaboration of organizations are the are the hosts for this amazing event and again a very warm welcome to our speaker and to all of the guests that have joined us this afternoon i'll go to the chat box to look for hands i saw uh, patrick bond made a comment in the chat but i'll go for um i'll, I'll look for the participants who've added who maybe got their hands up would like to make comments questions uh give an input to, or just reflections there's quite a long, we've, we've actually privileged, we've got about 60 participants um, this, this evening. Um, any, any burning questions, comments from the floor? Okay, so perhaps while people are looking for the hand function, if you, if you can't find the hand function, then you'd like to uh, perhaps make a comment. Um, oh, there you go. Dominique and then Sydney. Uh, suddenly look at and i'm just scrolling down i think i'll take those two hands for the moment thanks Sorry, Vivek you have and hamida uh quick question from my side very useful uh and a great overview um and i think there's this broad agreement between us the one question i would ask though is what would your conception be of the role of the state uh within your uh, analysis of uh, imperialism being a class project? Because wouldn't the state uh, be very intertwined and interlinked, or at least aspects of the state um, in advancing an imperialist project, even if it may come at costs, um, economic costs, not uh, in, in the short term, but for longer term benefits. Um, anyway, what do you think? Um, is it Hamida? Can I answer them one at a time, or do you want to take a list? It's, it's uh, and I, I think let's take two or three if you don't mind. Um, I see there's Sydney and then there's um, Latif Parker, so we'll take those three if you don't mind, and then sure. um, while you're responding, people can perhaps think of other questions or then raise their hands if you don't mind. But, yeah, let's take no more than three though, because I don't want yes, to yes, no more lose than three. anything. Absolutely. Okay. No, absolutely. No more than three. So I'll just take Sydney and then Latif, and then you have you you respond. If that's okay. Yes. Right. Can sure. you hear me? Yes, yes we can. can. You may go ahead, Sydney. Okay. Thanks. Um, thanks very much, Vivek. That was really really helpful. I mean, in such a uh, in such a short space of time, you summarised so much and so much that I didn't know about. My question, you raised the issue of, of the Vietnam War and the, rise, the uprising of, of people um, against that war, the popular, the American, ordinary Americans, mostly students, I guess. I don't know if it was. But what's your comment? Could you make a comment on Occupy Wall Street in that regard? Because there you had a resistance against a certain capitalist class, I guess aspects of the capitalist class, the Wall Street, uh, symbolically. Um, what is your understanding of the effectiveness of that Occupy Wall Street uprising? Yes. OK, uh, third. Thanks, Sydney. Um, could we have um, Latif? OK. All right, I'm, he's, I'm he's muted, he's muted. He's, he's muted. Okay. Could you unmute please Latif and then ask your question so that we could give uh, uh, Professor Vivek the opportunity? 
to respond. Am, am I okay now? Mm -hmm. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. I find your talk quite stimulating. But I have some issues. Um, the epoch of imperialism came after 1873. Um, Lenin never dealt with the question of imperialism, but Engels and Lenin subsequently dealt with the epoch of imperialism as the export of capital from the met metropolitan countries uh, because they could not invest into the countries, into the metropolitan countries themselves, because uh, there has been, uh, there has been, uh, there was no space. So they had to invest to use the money overseas, like the French invested in the railways in Russia, uh, the, the British in South America, and uh, that was ushered in the epoch of imperialism uh, as we know it today. Uh, uh, the the, the, uh, the uh, When they went into the colonies and so on, uh, that is another aspect. It was also imperial, but this, the phase we are in now is the export of capital. That is dominant. We don't need to, to be in the countries anymore. We have the nationalist, like in South Africa, you had the governor general. In India, you had the governor general. Subsequently, they abandoned that and they had the, the local nationalist uh, bourgeoisie, junior bourgeoisie, but finance capital was still dominant. You don't need to be in the country anymore. You can control through the dominance of capital. We are in the phase now where the world is globalist. I'm not talking about globalization. If you look at Diamond, uh, the, the big investors of JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, or if you look at Warren Buffett and so on, the, the world is their market. It's not only anymore a country. They are globalist in their outlook. They look for profits globally. The United States, remember, uh, uh, 1873, 1890, ushered in the epoch of decline of capitalism. Capitalism is in decline. If you look at what they what is happening today, they are going back to the policies, not of Reagan and Thatcher, but the policies before that. Because the policies of, uh, you know, uh, of Reagan and Thatcher has not benefited, has not worked. It, for 60 years, it didn't go, it, it, it didn't function correctly. And now they're going back to a policy of stimulating, investing, and so on. It is not a lack of capital. If you look at the Bank of Mellon, New York, I looked at the, at, at the cash reserves last month, they had $39 trillion cash in the bank, but they're not investing. There are particular reasons why they're not investing, why they're securing, there's limited investment into the third world. There's, uh, there's in, if you look at Africa, Asia, and so on, they are, there's a need for investment. Please round up your point, if you don't mind. You see, okay. I need, I need to develop. I, I need so to. I just, I, I'd like to give yeah, but, okay, the I opportunity to be there. respond. So, there so if you can just, you, you, you want to sum issues. up your point? I looked at political economy as the basis of my understanding how society works and how the transition, we are in a period of transition. And we need to understand that as transitional epoch we are in, we need to look at the role of Stalinism for the last 70, 80 years, why things didn't work out the way it, you know, it, 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 why we are in this impasse. But, you know, I need more time to explain and to put my position, my uh, not, I would say, alternative position, 
but a different perspective which I have on these issues. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Comrade. If I can ask Professor Vivek to take the floor. Thank you very much. Yeah, let me start with uh, Dominic's question about the state. Um, Dominic, if, if I might have misunderstood you, so please correct me. You, you seem to suggest that uh, in any imperial country, even if it is the case that the economic system does not require imperialism, the state would still be quite invested in it for the long-term perhaps benefits to the capitalist class, if not the system as a whole, and for the political benefits that the state gets from it. Would that be accurate? I think to clarify, I think that they, there are people within the state who would form part of uh, those who would want to advance a imperialist class project. Okay. So how do you make the distinction then between the state and the class project um, if uh, imperialism may impede uh, a national agenda? Um, so I think it's, a, it's, it's an unnecessary um distinction almost what's the unnecessary distinction dominic between uh the national project or and the class project if the state is a key okay. uh okay so let me you brought the discussion to a very important uh juncture i think and it allows me to say something very that's essential to the argument i'm trying to make so thank you um you have to understand Imperialism cannot be effectu effectuated without the state take, playing an absolutely central role in it. So to understand how and why the imperial project is furthered, we need to embed it within our understanding of and our theory of the state. Now in the classic underconsumptionist view, the state is acting for the benefit or the stability of the system as a whole when it goes out into its imperial ventures. It's going out into the imperial ventures because the system demands it. So even if capitalists are not demanding an imperial, outwardly imperial policy, the state will undertake it because it's the state's role to maintain stability. The state therefore is still serving capitalism by virtue of advancing imperialism. Now, any Marxist account of the state has to abide by the basic dictum that the state is subordinate to capital. And I agree with that. My argument says the state by virtue of being subordinate to capital undertakes imperial ventures when capitalists impose pressure on the state to do so. It doesn't undertake those imperial ventures because there's a systemic need to do so. So in my argument, it's more conjunctural. Now, that's, that means then that we should not expect to find the state hardwired into imperialism. We should expect to find a state that weighs the costs and benefits of the imperial demands that are being put on it. There will therefore be, as you say, Dominic, there will be coalitions within the state that are very pro-empire. But there might also be coalitions that are saying, this is imprudent for us right now to undertake because we don't have the, the uh, revenues, the budgetary allocations, it's going to make all sorts of political problems at home. It will uh, not allow us to undertake uh, policy commitments that we've made at home, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, you should expect to find at the very least a debate within the state. Now let's look at the 19th century of the classic imperial state, which is England. What do you find? There were in fact coalitions, some making arguments for, some making arguments against expanding the British empire. What was the dominant coalition? It's undoubted, it's absolutely uh, unimpeachable that the dominant coalition from, I would say, 1700 to, 2000, to 1900 was the anti-imperial coalition. The English state was basically committed to avoiding imperialism, except in particular occasions when the circumstances allowed constellations of capitalists to come in and make their cases. And that's when they expanded abroad. Which means, Dominic, that state was making a distinction between 
the national project, that is to say, what the what is the national agenda for it, and the class project of empire. And through most of the 19th century, the English state said, we are not going to undertake the imperial demands that are being put on us because they will obstruct the underlying class commitments to the, the capitalist class that we've already made. That's the empirical record. So theoretically, I would say, I don't think it's a mistake to distinguish between a national interest in imperialism and a class interest. I think that the historical record bears it out. I think for Marxists, it's essential to say imperialism always was and always will be a boondoggle between the capitalist class and the state that they are willing to influence. And if the class struggle gets to the point where labor has a real say, labor can be the counteracting force within the state that says, you will not undertake these, these measures. You will instead commit to redistributive progressive policies and not to the military. Okay, now let me take up Sydney's question. Um, Occupy is an interesting phenomenon, Sydney. You had asked how effective was it? Let me, in, in brief, we can say it was far more effective than it had any right to be. <laughs> uh, by historical standards, the Occupy Wall Street was a tiny, tiny movement in terms of numbers, very small. You had a lot of outposts of Occupy. There were maybe I don't know, 300 cities where you had some um, local representation of the Occupy. A park would be occupied somewhere, a building somewhere else. But that's the fact that you had it in 300 cities or so obscures the fact that it was 10 or 12 people, 40 people at any given moment in that particular city. More importantly, these were not workers. These were most, mostly students, professionals, the unemployed. And what they were occup occupying was not the sinews of capital accumulation. They weren't occupying factories. They weren't occupying economic locations. They were occupying random spaces, which means they had zero ability to actually disrupt the economy. Given that, it's remarkable how much of an impact they had on the culture, the Occupy movement. It's, why did they? I think it's because they tapped into a phenomenally deep unhappiness and anger on the part of working class Americans at the last 40 years of neoliberalism. Everyone had thought that their anger was individual, that nobody else felt that way. And when Occupy happens and they see it on the media and they see that the others feeling that same way, that's when it spreads. And because of that, the symbolic and cultural resonance of Occupy is far in excess of its political power. I think therefore that one can say it was more effective than one would have expected. And you know, the Sanders phenomenon, what really got things moving in the United States was the Bernie Sanders candidacy in 2016. I think Sanders built on the cultural um, churning that Occupy had set into motion. It did not create it. Occupy itself didn't do anything, but it was a mechanism that allowed the American population to see that the discontent with neoliberalism was very deep and very widespread. And literally, you know, that is sort of, to use a hackneyed phrase of Mao, that was the spark that lit the prairie fire in the American political system. So you have to give a lot of, I think, causal weight to Occupy in triggering the shift in the political culture that we are now undertaking or that is now underway in the United States. I hope that answers your question. If it does not, uh, please come back and, and uh, I'll, clear, I'll try to address it better. La Latif, I, I don't know where we disagree, if we disagree. As you said, um, it's unfair. You, you wanted to have more time to clarify your points. The basic point you're making that today Capital doesn't need national country-based investment strategies. It's a global strategy and the world is a market. Absolutely, you're, you're absolutely right about that. Um, that is this a transitional stage? I, I don't know. Uh, transitions are usually only understood post facto. <laughs> um, I don't think we're in the tra transition into any grand new stage of capitalism. I do think we're in a political transition. I think that the era of unchallenged neoliberalism is over. Okay. Uh, but where, whether we get something new, I don't know. Cool, and I think that that like thanks, Vivek. I think that actually leads us into into Denzel's um, question, where he's saying 
that you mentioned that class struggle is stagnant in America was was stagnant for 40 years. Um, what's your take on South on the South African situation? And do you predict a class implosion taking place? So while you respond to that one, I think I just wanted to make reference to the the hands in the chat group. Um, we'll take um, Roger, Chi Hing Su, and uh, I think Patrick Bond was the third hand. Um, after you respond to that question, thank you very much. Um, you know, it would be, I think, uh, foolhardy of me to pronounce to 50 odd comrades in South Africa, what's gonna happen in South Africa. You know so much more than I do. Um, sitting here from the vantage point and the few trips that I've made, I think it's, one can say that the situation has been, let's just say disappointing in South Africa uh, for a long time and somewhat dire. Uh, is there likely to be an explosion? I just don't think, I think Marxists need to be very, very, very circumspect about predicting explosions because the theory on which the predictions of explosions is based is a very poor theory. It suggests that if things are bad enough, long enough, people revolt. Now, if you stretch that timeline long enough, that, the, that prediction will come out to be true because every country undergoes explosions at some point. <laughs> but for this idea to be true that if you oppress people enough, they rebel, there has to be a time limit on how long you're willing to see them take that oppression before you're willing to revise your theory. In my opinion, and this is what the book that I'm, that's coming out in a few months is going to argue, Marxists have not appreciated the full force of their own theory when it comes to understanding class struggle. The Marxist theory does not predict that if you exploit people bad enough and long enough, if you treat them badly enough, long enough, they will revolt. At least it shouldn't predict that. Whether or not they revolt depends on whether or not they can get organized, whether or not they can undertake all the sacrifices and all the struggles it takes to revolt. And those sacrifices and those struggles are ones that most of the time people try to avoid. So in South Africa, is it likely that 25 years of neoliberalism will be over sometime soon? Just sitting over here, I would say no. I don't see much sign that in South Africa things are gonna turn around. The left seems to be demoralized. The Communist Party is in retreat. Uh, the ANC is thoroughly corrupt and yet it has enormous legitimacy. And what one was thinking that perhaps this new union federations would do something and it's, it's quite clear that they're doing what they've been taught to do, which has not worked in the past 40 years. There's not a lot of new thinking going on from what I can see in South Africa, which means that the chances of a strategic reorientation and a more militant class strategy, to me, sitting over here with the information I have, they seem quite remote. And um, the only country I see in worse, well, not the only, many countries in worse shape, but the only thing solace I can give you is at least you're not in India, <laughs> where things are even infinitely worse. Sure, thanks. But I think quite a, quite a deep analysis and quite insightful. Um, if I could ask the comrades on the chat uh, to please come in. So starting with um, Roger Edmund, then Chi Hing Su, and I see Patrick seems to have left up, but left us. But I'll take those two comments uh, or questions. Thanks. Thanks very much. And good afternoon. Um, uh, the question I wanted to raise was around the the benefits to the in the working class of imperial imperialist countries from the imperial project, and it. I, I understand the point that you make that that benefit is not automatic and that it depends on class struggle in those countries to access uh, some of that benefit. But it seems to me that nevertheless, uh, if you like, there's kind of more available at the bargaining table than there would be without the imperialist project. And uh, right now, for example, we argue that uh, illicit financial flows take money out of South Africa, which otherwise might be at least on the bargaining table for mining unions, for example, uh, but it's no longer there. So the employers can more easily plead 
poverty as they do. So it seems to me that it may not be the case that it's an automatic uh, uh, acquisition. Uh, uh, we got cut off. Yeah. But I think I got the gist uh, of what Roger was saying. Sorry, but sure. there is a privilege. Sorry, I, I need yes. to finish. I was being interrupted. Thanks. Not a problem. Thank you so much. I think it was Chi Heng Su. Hello, um, Professor Vivek. I'm Chi Heng Su from Taiwan. Um, thank you for a wonderful talk. I totally agree with your conclusion that imperialism is a class project, not a national project. But I'm wondering about the motives for anti-imperialism movement. Because what we've seen is there are lots of revolution that colonized workers are more willing to fight imperialism for self-determination, even with work together with native capitalists. So it seems that what really motiv motivates them is about the national project, not the class project. I'm wondering how do you think about that? Thank you. Hi, thanks. Comrade Patrick? Uh, very warm greetings to comrades. I'm in Durban, and it's so good to see Vivek and to see all the other comrades. The, the thing you do so well, Vivek, to, to search for the underlying laws of motion of the system, I, I fully celebrate. But may I just fight with you on the question of Rosa and whether she's under consumption, so, you know, it's a kind of quick and easy uh, write-off. But uh, as Latif said, the real dilemma at the time, uh, 1913, she wrote Accumulation, was export of capital. You know, she'd, re she'd read uh, Hobson, John Hobson's study when he was based here in South Africa. And South Africa and Namibia, DRC, these were central, uh, chapter 27 of Accumulation. And I think this is terribly important to, to kind of get right. I'm not sure I would agree. Um, because if you take the Luxembourg, the difference between her reading of imperialism and Lenin, Bukharin, uh, Hilferding, the others of the era, uh, would you agree that it was about capitalism and the non capitalist? So it's not really that she saw the search for new markets, but rather the search for super exploitation, a word you used. And it's in that sense, um, I think you're right, Vivek, that um, activists really find uh, Luxembourg very compelling. But some of us as uh, Marxist theorists do as well, because she opened up for us capital and the non-capital in ecological, in gender, in race, ethnicity, in north-south terms, in ways that I think are absolutely most relevant to the moment, more so and more durable than internecine uh, inter-imperial competition of the others. So I do want to ask just two quick questions. If you do find uh, that capitalist, non-capitalist relations um, are part of the Luxembourg contribution to the theory, and from there, people like uh, Grossman or you know plenty of others down the ages, my, my supervisor, David Harvey, for example, would stress that there is something extraordinarily open about that kind of Marxist um, alliance building. Um, and it also does put the onus, to be frank, on a labor aristocracy in the North that hasn't come to grips with these advantages of uh, global race, global gender, and particularly global ecology unequal ecological exchange. Is that a concept you'd recognize? It hasn't been mentioned, but it is absolutely central to the um, standard of living that the North enjoys, the massive climate debt that people in the global North, uh, you know, like myself here in Durban, we enjoy. And my second question uh, is- um, Hey, that's a lot know, of questions, Patrick. No, it's just one question, really. Can we bring <laughs> Luxembourg one back- One question, many clauses. Oh, yeah, I don't know that much <laughs> From a <laughs> perspective. But the second well, is, do we, do we not have a... Patrick, I think you're giving the interpreters a hard time. I'm so sorry, uh, some, somebody's having a party. But listen, the question that we're really occupied with at the moment, comrade, is will the South African government uh, send troops to it's going to be uh, on the table this week in the SADC meeting uh, in order to support uh, the um, uh, SAS generally, the deputy sheriff. And as Patrick, uh, how I can't, I can't get anything you're saying. So there's something wrong with Patrick, the could you, could, Yeah, could you maybe switch your video off because your connection is really bad. We're not hearing you. 
actually, I think it's other people speaking over me, but never mind. It's very quick. Is sub imperialism a category in your analysis? We're feeling it here this week as SADC meets and Cyril Ramaphosa deploys uh, the SANDF, our army, which he's done many times, uh, particularly to enforce an extreme lockdown, but also that we know in uh, the DRC, in um, uh, Lesotho, in the Central African Republic, they do a magnificent job in enforcing corporate power in the way you said, right, that the state is the executive committee. I do think a sub imperial layer is opened up, but you didn't mention it. Is it also part of your repertoire? Thanks, comrade. Great, great talk. Okay. Uh, these are three. Oh, uh, am I coming through cleanly now? Yeah, you are. Okay. Please go ahead. These are three terrific sets of questions. Absolutely crucial. Um, so let me and Rogers and Patrick's relate somewhat. I won't, I won't combine them into, into one long answer, but there will be some overlap. Uh, I very much agree with Roger's point that while workers as a class don't benefit from imperialism without class struggle, there might, however, be more surplus available for them to fight over with their employers. Absolutely. Uh, it's just that because it's an empirical question, it's hard to sustain, uh, Roger, any deep theoretical traction or implications from it. There are going to be corporations who are going out into the developing world who are just eking out an existence. The mere fact that they're out into, in, investing in another country doesn't mean that they are gigantic accumulators of capital. It just means that they have an, a, a, a foreign interest. And there are many, for example, with English imperialism in the 19th century, you know, the firms that were the most aggressively imperialistic in their demands were small firms. And they were just barely surviving in those imperial markets. So when they brought home their profits to negotiate with their workers or when they negotiated with the workers abroad, um, they were not fighting over a gigantic pool of the surplus. Now, of course, there's many corporations that are, and they do have gigantic pools of surpluses and those are growing through imperialism. But the point is that the level of abstraction that we're dealing with, which is foreign oriented firms and what that means for the working class, you can't derive any conclusions because of the sectoral shift and the sectoral um, differences that you'll find across those firms and even within a given sector. Uh, so I, the, the main point remains that it's going to be up to the class struggle whether or not workers are going to benefit from any imperial venture. There's no intrinsic advantage that workers in foreign oriented firms might have, especially now in the era of outsourcing, where so many firms that have a foreign outlook are now tiny and only a small part of a gigantic value chain, the totality of which might be generating a big surplus, but any given node within that is going to probably be quite small. I therefore don't think that at the level of abstraction at which the theory of imperialism works, you can derive any conclusions. It comes down to the firms that we're talking about and the level of their profits which basically means, Roger, it's just capitalism. This is the same thing that you can say in capitalism. Some firms have lots of profits, some firms don't. Some firm can negotiate for higher wages, other firms can't. I think with imperialism, it's close enough to that, that I don't think one can say, one can derive the conclusion that you were pushing for, which is, isn't there in general, by and large, an advantage that workers in outward oriented firms might have? I, I don't think that there is, but it's an empirical question and I'd be very willing to revise my judgment on that. Uh, Hung, what you said is really true, I think. I, I think if you look at countries where anti-colonial movements turn into liberation movements, I, I think it happened where you could get a cross-class class alliance around the national question. Um, all across the, the third world, where you had communists coming to power, even in China, it was largely around a nationalist agenda, not a pure class agenda. Now, that does not mean that they were not driven by a deep class content. Look at Vietnam, it's a very good example. Yeah, I think the Vietnamese revolution occurs as a national revolution, that's right, but, the national revolution cannot occur except through the class, the anti-landlord orientation of the Vietnamese peasants. The reason that 
so-called South Vietnam fails as a state. Despite all the money that the US is giving them, despite all the, the goods that imperialism lavishes upon South Vietnam to make it viable, the reason it fails is because the, the Vietnamese landlord class and the Vietnamese mm, entrepreneurial class, small as it is, refuses to budge even one inch on the land question and the rent question. So that Vietnamese peasants see no choice but to rise up in revolution. And this is what the US could not understand. Similarly in China, yes, anti-Japanese nationalism and anti-Western nationalism plays a big role. But if the Chinese landlord class had relented, you would not have had a revolution. So the way I would put it is these revolutions are motivated, not uh, they're, they're rationalized and they're described and they're organized as national revolutions by the communist parties, but the engine driving them is class struggle. Where you don't get the class struggle, say India, you don't get the class struggle, you do not get the revolution. And the reason is the Indian bourgeoisie and the Indian landlord class gave in, they relented, they gave them democratic rights, they allowed for trade unions. And so the labor movement and the peasant movement could be absorbed into the national movement. I, I hope this addresses your question. I hope I'm not talking my way out of giving you an answer. My view is, it's, I would say where I would correct your position or amend it is by saying peasants in Vietnam, peasants in Malaysia, peasants in India were all motivated primarily by the class question. No, they never even saw, an Indian peasant never saw a British administrator. Same in Vietnam, they rarely saw a French administrator. Who were they fighting against? They're fighting against their landlords. The difference was how the landlord classes reacted in those two instances. Now, let, so if, if you feel I haven't answered your question, please uh, let me know. The motivation was anti, was class, but the realization was a national one, is my point. Uh, Patrick, Patrick, I, I, I uh, respectfully, you're confusing Rosa with Lenin. Rosa Luxemburg is, absolutely clear that capitalism, it's not that in this conjuncture after 1873, firms are going outward for super exploitation or super profits. That's Lenin's view. In Rosa's case, capitalism rests on colonialism because it cannot create a market sufficient to sell its goods. The accumulation of capital as a book is built around that. Now, when you get to the end and she talks about the destruction of the natural economy, the reason, why is she talking about destroying the natural economy as opposed to simply unequal exchange and super profits? The destruction of the natural economy is how you create a market for the goods that you cannot sell at home. That wasn't Hobson's view. That's Rosa's view. The person who's more influenced by Hobson is Lenin actually. Uh, and I think that's pretty clear when you read the notebooks to imperialism and when you read imperialism itself as a book. So in my view, it's, it's Luxembourg who is the patron saint of underconsumptionism. I think it's impossible to miss when you read the accumulation of capital. Now you're, you're asking in your question uh, for Luxembourg, what she's opening up is the capital versus non-capital struggle as the animating force between, behind imperialism. Uh, yeah, as long as you understand that what's driving capital against non-capital is the, the uh, problem of effective demand. I think that's true. I think she's deeply mistaken in that argument. And I think the historical record bears it out in two ways, Patrick. One is the system after 1918 continued to expand while the colonial world contracted. And there's no doubt whatsoever, the countries that expanded the fastest and benefited the most were the ones that had no empire. It's Northern Europe, it's Japan, and Japan's empire is taken away from it after 1936. Korea, what, what empire does Korea have? These countries are all expanding on what in fact Marx talks about in volume one of Capital. It's increasing productivity, it's productivity gains. That's what drives it all. Now, do they benefit from things like unequal exchange? No, the, the way, and, and Marxists need to get straight about this. Working class gains have come on the back of productivity gains. Fundamentally, they've come on the back of productivity gains, not on leeching off the rest of the world. Across, 
as my, in my answer to Roger, I said, yes, in instances where that's possible, where the profits from imperial plunder are there and workers have been able to get enough power to redirect it towards themselves, yes, they benefit. But as a rule, if you look across capitalism, what has driven the rising standards of living in the West is not empire, it's productivity. It is the relentless pursuit of relative surplus value. I don't think there's even a scintilla of doubt around this. If you just look at national income accounts, it's not because of imperialism. Unequal exchange, yes, the workers benefit, but understand what is unequal exchange? Unequal exchange occurs whenever there's an equalization of profit rates across sectors. Workers benefit from unequal exchange primarily from unequal exchange within a country, not between countries. The classic essay on this is not by Arigi Emanuel, but by Anwar Sheikh, who in his essay on imperialism shows this beautifully. So yes, unequal exchange benefits workers, but not the kind that you were talking about. On the question of sub-imperialism, yeah, Patrick, absolutely, there is sub-imperialism, because why? Because in a country like South Africa, in a country like India, in a country where there is now some kind of a capitalist class emerging, they're doing what capitalists in England were doing and France were doing in the 19th century. They're telling their states, help us get into the weaker countries around our region. In South Africa, it's around the Southern African region. In India, it's around South Asia. And the, the state abides. The state says, okay, because it's a bourgeois state. So there's no doubt whatsoever that what we call sub-imperialism exists. The issue again is what's driving it. And in my case, what's driving it is the political power of the capitalist class, not the systemic needs of capitalism. Thanks very much, Vivek. I don't see any more hands, so maybe I could just verbally just ask them, is there any burning question, comment, um, besides the rebuttal from Patrick, which is in the chat, so that we avoid a dialogue that anybody would like to make? Uh, otherwise, we will we'll thank Vivek and close the session. I'm just checking. I know there was the best at one point you wanted to make a comment, but I wasn't sure whether your question was answered and therefore you lowered your hand. Um, I'm just going through the chat group now and I'm seeing there's nobody with, with, with any questions or wanting to make a comment. So Vivek, I must say, I mean, I've been quite uh, enthralled by your, by your presentation. Um, I don't want to be biased and, and raise the issues of labor. Um, you know, it, I found it quite enlightening um, that from your perspective, you were pushing, you still see labor as playing quite a critical role. I mean, you obviously follow, uh, you know, the labor movement across various countries and you can see the difficulties and challenges that we're having in South Africa at the moment. So again, without having to be biased and, and belabor the point or go into a discussion specifically in labor, I'd like to personally say coming from the research arm of Kusato, I'm glad because many people still ask, you know, is there space? For the trade union movement, and um, I think maybe through other discussions, and maybe I'll take it side, uh, you know, offline, uh, just to engage a bit more, because I do believe, you know, particularly when we've got such an onslaught um, and a weakening, uh, a weakening left, that labour, despite the challenges, is probably the only vehicle, institutional home, for us to begin to think of of, of bringing about an alternative, um, or, or to engage uh, the working class project. So. From my side, I'm deeply appreciative of, of that particular comment. I see there was another there were another there was another comment in the chat, um, which says, "So can we agree that greed can also be seen as a driving force?" And this was from Ayaka. Um, I think that was just a, a general comment. Uh, no. That greed is greed is never a driving force of any uh, political economic phenomena. Uh, anybody can be greedy. What the driving force? is profit seeking, which is capitalists seek profits, not because they're greedy. They seek profits because profits is how they survive in the system. So it's a structural compulsion. Uh, and so it's, it's profits and power that are the driving force. Greed is something that's always existed. Feudal lords had greed, slave masters in Rome had greed, but it didn't give you what we are trying to analyze as imperialism. So as socialists should give up on this Greed is awful, it's terrible, and one should fight it. One should encourage people not to be greedy, but one should never make the mistake of thinking that it's purely personal motives like this that drive system-wide phenomena like imperialism or um, profit maximization. Thanks, Vivek. And then there's another, another question. 
in, in the there chat. There was a question in there about black capitalism. Um, and I think since we're talking about South Africa, I really like to take it up. Could you read that one, Amida? Please, please. So, um, so if colonialism held a black capitalism, is it not true that slavery, say in the US, in terms of cotton and mining in Southern Africa under colonialism, helped advance the development of capitalism? Yes, absolutely. Uh, but understand, they helped develop, they helped advance the development of capitalism, not because they made lots of money. And Marxists need to be clear on this question. Making a lot of money from something doesn't give you capitalism. It doesn't help you advance capitalism because what you do with the money is the key. There were many, many activities prior to the rise of capitalism that made enormous, enormous revenues and surpluses for the ruling classes in those countries. There was, there was slavery before cotton slavery that was always very remunerative. There was serfdom. There was all sorts of things. The reason slavery, cotton slavery, chattel slavery in the US advances the growth of capitalism is because that's those slave formations are embedded in a class environment where the surplus is used in a capitalistic way, which means it's because of the structural situation of the slavers that it advances capitalism, not because there's something intrinsic in slavery that gives you capitalism. There's an odd, and let me just say that there's a very strange tendency among especially younger Marxists today, that if you really, really, really hate slavery, you must say that it is the cause of everything that we hate about the world, including capitalism. It's an odd thing to say. Suppose slavery had not contributed anything at all to capitalism. What would your verdict be? That, okay, well, now we can excuse it. I'm not attributing this to you, but just there's a lot of this on the left, a kind of moralism and emotivism that if you want to prove that you're anti-slavery, tell us that it caused capitalism. Why? It might have been completely peripheral to capitalism. It's still an abomination. So separate out the empirical question of how slavery relates to the growth of capitalism from the moral question of whether or not you're condemning it. This is also what was behind so much third world nationalism in the 60s and 70s. If we really hate imperialism, we must show that imperialism is what made the West rich. Why? Suppose it didn't, and in fact, it didn't. You still condemn it. The moral verdict on a particular system of exploitation has nothing to do with whether or not it creates enormous riches for the society as a whole. The moral verdict comes on, on your assessment of how one group of people is treating another group of people. In my uh, view, slavery in the United States did accelerate the growth of capitalism, but it need not have. And it certainly didn't say any, do anything to uh, spread. I can't validate this right now, it's a separate talk, but this notion that slavery is what gave you the industrial revolution in England is ridiculous. It did no such thing. We have to separate out the two questions of our judgment about slavery and the empirical effects it has on wealth creation. Sure, and I think Hassan and Martha then, um, you know, want you to just uh, touch a little bit more on the issue of extractivism, if you can. So leading um, on to that tell question. Me what, people use that word a lot. Tell me what you mean by it. Well, well let's talk mining in this particular case. Yeah. Mining yeah. under the Oppenheimers okay. or even before. Right. And the question, Hassan, is what about mining? Yeah, well, you know, I mean, they thrived under colonial conditions as well. Yes. Yeah. So, so, so we can set, so again, it's not a surprise that mine owners grew tremendously wealthy through uh, a colonial arrangement in mm -hmm. which they were given extraordinary powers over their workers. Not a doubt at all, not, not a surprise at all. Now, mm -hmm. can we say that there are other wider benefits that mining might have had to the economy? Well, that's an empirical question. There are situations in which mining can be connected to the rest of the economy through linkages where you can say, Mining was the uh, mechanism on which the economic growth occurred. And then there are situations in which it's more of an enclave economy where you can say it might not have. In my understanding of South Africa and Zimbabwe, mining created enormous riches for capitalists, but did very little for national development. Very little. But, but that's clearly, it was but Vivek, yeah. Vivek, wasn't there connections with British, British capitalism? The, uh, and Bo British imperialism. Yes. 
right? Yes. And yeah. then, oh, South Africa sourced uh, migrant labor from Lesotho for hundreds of years. And, and you know, so I'm saying, in a way, the docility of labor preparing the groundwork for capitalism in a way that labor was not to be rebellious, not to, you know, I mean, there are continuities and discontinuities I, I'm, I'm yes. trying to do. Yes. And now we're doing actual class analysis. You see, now we've moved away from the Luxembourgist notion or the Leninist notion of these systemic forces that are driving imperialism. And we're saying in those instances, in those particular sectors, might uh, imperial capital have played a role in either fueling metropolitan capital. And now in the South African case, the gold coming out of South Africa is crucial to the sustaining of the gold standard in England. And I think that no, the Boer War doesn't happen if England doesn't feel a real economic stake in platinum and in gold mining in South Africa. There's no Boer War without that, right? So this is, to go back to the uh, early question, I think it was uh, Dominic's question about the national and the class. In that instance, the British state says, the British political economy has a stake in keeping some control over South African mining. The, the political economy as a whole, not just a capitalist class. Whereas when British merchants who are trading with China tell England, the English state, the Victorian state, please help us colonize China, the English state says, no. There's nothing here that is going to benefit us as managers of the bourgeois economy. Two instances where capitalists are lobbying the British state to deepen its imperial ties. In one instance, the state goes with it. The other, it says no. It's because the state is making calculations, not because the state has a systemic drive to expand outward, but because it's making contingent calculations on the relative costs of undertaking this venture. Now, now we're doing real political economy. Similarly, uh, Hassan, your question about labor. Does the labor regime of mining create the kind of culture of exploitation that other sectors of capital might benefit from? Perhaps. It's, I'm saying perhaps, I'm not giving you an unalloyed yes, because mining is a tricky sector. Historically, the one sector of capitalism that has been the most troublesome and the most rebellious has also been mining. True everywhere. So does mining have a clear benefit in terms of the culture of exploitation that it creates? I, I I would say perhaps probably not, but because Kosatu, you'll correct me, had a big base in the mining industry, and Kosatu for a period was the most militant union on earth, you know, up until the early '90s, certainly. So, but my point is now we're doing actual political economy rather than this kind of world systems or um, uh, underconsumptionist stuff, which has crippled Marxist analysis. I think. Cool. Thanks, so, Vic. I think you know definitely really engaging comments and questions. And I think um, I want to thank everybody who's participated. We've, we started off with about 58 uh, participants and we've stayed with, I mean, we, we're still on 50, noting that it's a Sunday evening. So I must thank everybody for participating. I think the, the hosts of this event, which is the, um, the dialogue for an anti-capitalist future. I think Dominic has just screen shared, uh, you know, the upcoming events, but I think also for the organizers with regards to this particular discussion, I think really key comments and particularly additional themes and trends that have come out for, for further deliver, uh, uh, some deliberation and engagement. But thank you very, very much um, to you, Vivek, for your insights and provocations and in some instances, contradictions, but I think really stimulating discussion. Um, and I want to thank everybody else. I don't know if the, if the host or somebody from AIDC wants to do a final thank you in closing, but from my side, thank you very, very much. Thank you, it was a pleasure and an honor. Thank you, Samida, and uh, thanks to you again, Vivek. Um, I think uh, one can always appreciate the very clear way in which you present and the admirable way in which you deal with questions and comments. I think there's lots to learn, even if we don't agree with all that you say. Uh, but in spite of that, I think we've learned a lot uh, from your engagement, and we hope that you'll be available for future engagements as well. So many, many thanks. And then um, just to say, comrades, we have two more lectures in the in the 10 part series. I'm quite excited about the, the next ones as well. Next week, Sunday, we have Professor Andrew Nash, 
were given inputs on South African traditions of Marxism, Marxism at 4 p.m., the usual time slot. And then the following Sunday, we have Professor Eddie Webster on labor, technological change, and the future of working class organization. We will share um, links to register uh, for each of those chats um, during the course of the week. And we hope that comrade also uh, make sure to follow the Facebook page as well as the YouTube page for uh, the recording, which we will share soon. And lastly, I think uh, a big, big thank you to all the participants to reiterate what comrade Amida was saying, but also a special thanks to Amida and to the interpreters, Rachel and Natalie, uh, who's been with us from the very beginning and continues to do a sterling job. So many, many thanks to, to Natalie and Rachel. Viva uh, Rachel and Natalie, viva. And viva. Then, <laughs> viva, viva. And then to end, as we do every Sunday or at, with every lecture, please comrades unmute and let's give Professor Vivek a big round. Viva socialism, viva! 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 Viva!